Dennis, why don't we get started? Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Kalecki and welcome to the 466th Imagine Greater Buffalo program and our 88th virtual Imagine lecture hosted by our wonderful Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to start with our speaker shortly, but first a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the Downtown Central Library's Facebook page and YouTube channels. And we hope you share the link with your friends and networks. This program is created by ImagineLifelongLearning.com and the Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History and Nature, or Cezanne, as I pronounce the acronym. The overall theme of this Imagine series is to imagine Greater Buffalo as a premier North American cultural and nature center. Our second Tuesday emphasis today is on architecture and design. Now, on to our featured speaker, Robert Shibley. Bob is a State University of New York distinguished professor and the Dean of the University at Buffalo School of Architecture and Planning. Since joining UB in 1982, Professor Shibley has served in multiple and often overlapping capacities, including Chair of Architecture, Founding Director of the Urban Design Project, Campus Architect and Planner, and Director of the UB Regional Institute. His leadership and sponsored program portfolio has contributed to his AIA Thomas Jefferson Award for Public Architecture, his UB President's Medal, and 50 other national and regional architecture, urban design, planning, and economic development recognitions for the best plan, best practices, and curriculum innovation. Also, I might add, Bob is the first recipient, along with Chuck LaCusa, of the uh, annual IGB, Imagine Greater Buffalo Recognition Award. So now, let's welcome Robert Shibley to discuss Olmsted's design and Buffalo's future. Bob, take it away. Thanks, Dennis, very much. Um, is my slide showing properly? Yes. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna take about 20 minutes and do a, a kind of reflection on what Buffalo, constructing Buffalo might mean. And from the perspective of um, both my role at the university and my, um, my 40 years as a Buffalonian. The, the storyline I'm gonna offer, it really starts with the, the school itself um, and that that school is beholden to um, its ability to learn well about the city of Buffalo to the citizens of the city of Buffalo. It's our interaction with that citizenry that allows us to co-learn with the community that hosts us. And that's been a, a central driving point for the 50 year history of the School of Architecture and Planning. So this is a kind of love note between us and the city. Uh, and and it, always we welcome our students to the University at Buffalo in parallel with a welcome to Buffalo. Uh, our view is our city is our laboratory. And that's been true since we were founded in 1969 and, and really the, the steep part of the decline of our city uh, as we ultimately lost over half our population. It's been the school uh, engaging in the city landscape and, and landscape at exactly the time when we're in those, uh, that kind of crushing uh, loss of industry and re restabilization of the, 
the economy of our country that and our city that we actually uh, grew the school. So as we grew matured, increased the number of students, we also simultaneously saw and lived with the, the, the neighborhoods in decline. And you can't not be affected by that. We, you can't not engage it if you're serious about the relevance of architecture and planning in the lives of people. So it was a natural course that we would engage this city. Now tied to that is a necessary recognition that the city has a kind of armature of, of uh, water, of a uh, radial street plan, and, and, an, and an homestead conceit about the necessity to put our cities in park systems. And that's really what I wanna focus on. Uh, I'm suggesting in addition to that, there are a number of other avenues of exploration we take on in the city. Um, uh, parks, waterfronts, food systems, economic futures are all part of our menu of, of um, uh, course offerings, research inquiry and service contributions. Um, we, we think our educational program is life changing, a kind of learn by doing hands on uh, where our maker culture coincides with co-creating places for people in our city. And in that sense of things with the city in flux in the midst of the historic transformation, we see Buffalo facing persistent challenges in poverty, displacement, inequity and blight. These shifting societal urban landscapes ground our work and create openings for experimental boundary pushing, teaching and research. Some of the factory faculty led research and UB's deep connections to community uh, kind of incubate studio projects. And it's not like we go in and do a project and go home. We do it again and better and then again, again and better. And in that cycle of engagement, we find ourselves working consistently to um, stand on the shoulders of previous work by the communities we work with and by our student body and faculty. Um, we've been recognized for part of this city's transformation with a series of invitations, uh, one in 2018 to exhibit in Venice. Uh, and there we ran a film called See It Through Buffalo, which identified some 25 sites in the city that had been continuous sites of inquiry. This wasn't a film with voiceover and text, it was images and music. And it was intended to literally have the viewer ask the question uh, and question uh, the nature of the city we were revealing. It was good news, it was bad news, it was some of the best of times and worst of times in our city that were captured in the film. And it kind of introduced the, the world to Buffalo through the Venice Biennale experience. That experience was greeted with uh, an invitation to do it again. And so we went back in 2021 and this time we went with the tagline, Buffalo Constructing Buffalo from Olmsted to Van Valkenburg. And that's a reference to the philanthropic uh, kind of invitation of uh, uh, Olmsted to Buffalo to, to put something like Central Park in our city and the challenge to wait one, maybe we don't wanna put a park in the city, maybe from Olmsted's perspective, we wanna put the city in a park system. And that's what I wanna emphasize for the rest of this discussion. Uh, the chapter that I'm particularly intrigued with is that the Buffalo Project has been continuing in the vein of Olmsted's aspiration to put our city in a park system. A number of things play into that that we'll talk about in the course of the next few slides, but the, 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 the most immediate next chapter in Buffalo Constructing Buffalo in that vision of Olmsted is Ralph C. Wilson uh, uh, 
coming to town and, and suggesting perhaps LaSalle Park could be significantly better. Uh, well, what's that mean and how does it work is part of the exhibition story that we took to Venice. We engaged a Buffalo-based visual artist, Ariel uh, Alberg-Rigger, to capture the richness of this story. And the exhibition is presented in an immersive wall-to-wall -wall visual narrative, a think graphic novel that reveals the civic process behind the planning of the park, the history of the world-class design that uh, Van Valkenburg has offered us, and the urban planning that informed it and the best practices research that inspired it. The curatorial team were myself, uh, uh, Ariel, uh, Julia Jamrazic as a, uh, an assistant professor in our program with the Master of Architecture students, Lucas Svetsko, uh, Sanika Mantrum, Ruta Shinde, and Christopher Sweeney. This just puts you in the room in Venice <clears throat> where you are immersed in the storyline. You can see the narrative that uh, introduces us to William Dorsheimer as the civically engaged politician who really loved Central Park and thought Buffalo should have one, and his introduction to Olmsted. <clears throat> The experience of the kind of meta story in, in the exhibit is on the wall. The details are in the reports and books and volumes on the table. So you can do the usual gallery tour in a kind of overload condition in Venice, or you can sit down and pause for a minute and dive in deep to the books and background materials while you're still looking at the, the room surround and the graphic novel. Essentially, the storyline of this piece is by 1969, the city of Buffalo, New York was well into being slowly ripped apart and factories were laying off employees. Parks were being dug up and replaced with freeways and the Buffalo River burned. And um, the question we were asking at the school was how do we make spaces more accessible to people of all abilities and how can the built environment be more responsive to human goals and protective of increasing fragile ecologies? In an effort to answer those questions, our faculty in the 60s, late 60s, 70s, 80s, were, uh, were working hard to kind of think through the context of practical grounded work in the distressed economy and circumstance of the city. It was a collaboration in a deep and meaningful way, building our relationships with our community. Moving through 30 years of work, we built the city of Buffalo's comprehensive plan with a large citizen constituency and tremendous support from the city of Buffalo. We wrote the Olmsted Park and Parkway System Master Plan, the city of Buffalo's waterfront plan. And, uh, and in that mix carried forward what should be uh, the 21st century Buffalo. What should we focus on? Whose voices are included? And how these plans come together to outline kind of core policies moving ahead for our city. As you might guess, key themes included constructing Buffalo, Buffalo, Buffalo public schools uh, and, and delivering quality public services and a kind of reinvesting in the physical infrastructure of the city. Um, we recognized the region, its agricultural and uh, water abundance would make this city a very attractive city as we look into the dynamics of climate change and the future of the uh, ecology of our planet. We know in 68, when Dorsheimer was beginning to puzzle through things, we were already emerging as one of the largest and richest cities in the 19th century. So we have that legacy to build on. When Dorsheimer uh, brought the, the kind of creator of Central Park and Olmsted to town, Olmsted had two parallel reactions. He was taken with both the potential 
and the industrial disaster of the place. So here I wanna pause just a little bit and say, Olmsted wanted to place the city in a park system. Think about the idea that that project has been consistently pursued for the last, I'm gonna say uh, 50, 60 years, and even before that. But think about the Niagara Strait and both sides of the border and uh, the way in which we have attempted to connect and place that region in the water and border condition in a way that connects us across the border. Lake to lake is uh, and should be thought of as a park system. Think about the, the uh, Niagara Power Authority's relicensing process and $50 million into the Niagara River Greenway. Think about the Olmsted Park and Parkway systems eventual and gradual restoration and repair over these last 50 years. Think about the evolving uh, understanding of rails to trails of the evolution of the uh, Erie Canalway uh, system and how that connects us uh, upstate across the state. Um, and then work through the, the whole idea of interlocking greenways all the way to and now including the new Rousey Wilson Jr. Centennial Park, which is investing in two ways consistent with the Olmsted scheme. Way one is to make it a great park, and way two is to make sure it is connected with the Lake to Lake and Olmsted and other uh, parkway systems. Think about our work with the river line. Think about the way the Outer Harbor is evolving. Look at the Buffalo River now compared to where it was 20 years ago. All of those efforts and many, many more you can state are literally a part of the intellectual project that places our city in a park system and places our region in a park system. That theme of Olmsted's answers the question, what would Olmsted do today? He would keep on the project. He would continue to place our cities in park systems. So with that, you kind of understand uh, the transformation of LaSalle Park as one part of a larger effort. A very large community group participating in our uh, discussions about what the park should become and uh, a, a kind of uh, opening to, of the park to its um, most immediate Eastern neighbor by a grand bridge bringing you into the park across the throughway. So a new front door for LaSalle Park is part of the imaging we've done. One thing we know about this kind of work is that you, you, you know, if, if you don't know what a great park is like to experience, you don't know what to ask for. So we traveled to 21 parks in three cities with a focus group of citizens to examine really good parks and get ourselves excited and elevate expectations for what this park should be. And then put uh, Michael Van Valkenburg and his team and a very large and complex team it was to work to develop the concepts and will be um, uh, uh, I think uh, beginning construction on the bridge over the throughway starting next month in terms of the putting, a, putting, putting the groundbreaking event together. All of this is really a, a, a tribute to the way the citizens of today are looking at their city as a park system with the city in the park system. And if I leave you with one thought, it's let's keep doing that. Uh, ultimately, Imagine LaSalle has been an intentional 
uh, intentional in bringing together a diverse base of park users and nearby residents. So the, the park transformation is shaped by the community's vision for what a world-class waterfront park can be. And I'm gonna argue that the trails work and the connective work that is also being supported by Wilson right now is a, 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 a very important addition to all of that. I wanna be sensitive to time and I wanna leave time for some conversation because I think probably many people in the audience would be able to describe other efforts that are part of that Homestead project of placing our city in a park system. So let me uh, leave it open to discussion. Dennis, over to you. Perfect, uh, good summary and, uh, and a good segue into uh, uh, this presentation being a preview of Buffalo Day at Chautauqua, I'm going to, uh, I see Mark Wensler is on. Uh, I haven't asked him ahead of time. So, uh, Mark, if you're there, if you have a question I, I, uh, or any observation you'd like to make, Mark will be, uh, is at Chautauqua on the staff. He'll be the moderator for the uh, uh, three-person panel uh, on July 5th. Mark, can you uh, can we let Mark in on the uh, conversation? There. Hey, thanks, Dennis, and thank you, Bob. I'm going to stay off video just because I'm I'm homesick. You'll probably hear it in my sinusy <laughs> voice, but that was a wonderful presentation. And all, all I have to say is, you know, um, really looking forward to Bob and and his panelists kind of further elaborating on this topic. You know. Um, and extending beyond both Buffalo to sort of the national scale and, and what would Olmstead mean today in terms of our urban design and park design. Um, so just want to invite you all uh, who are listening to Buffalo Day at Chautauqua this summer. Um, we'll have a good, I think, hour and a half to explore these topics with Bob and his co-panelists. So thanks, Dennis, and thank you, Bob. Good, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, what type of questions do we have from our audience? Yep, so we have one question so far, um, actually a couple. A question about rethinking the Skajakwita corridor in relation to your question of what Olmstead would do today. As you know, before the 198 was built, almost the entire Skajakwita corridor was Olmsteadian landscape. In revisioning the corridor, what role do you think an Olmsteadian or neo-Olmsteadian approach should play? Is there still a place for that, or is that now out of date? I, I look at the Sajakwita work. I look at the way they're thinking about the Kensington, and I look at the new front door for LaSalle as three major projects, very consistent with the idea of placing our city in a park system. It knits the city back together where the Sajakwita divided us, where the Kensington divided us, and where the 198 divides us. These are gestures moving in exactly the right direction. And the range of options and the thoughtfulness and database that what's called Region Central represents literally brings the Albright Knox and the Niagara River into the same circulatory system. It connects it all and the Jesse Pringle path down the Sajakwita becomes the unifier that connects a pedestrian ambulatory system and a bicycle system with a reunited North and South Delaware Park separated by the Sajakwita. It's got great economic bones for an idea. It's got great urban uh, kind of context bones. It works well with bringing a closer together the valuable resource of the Niagara Strait and its waterfront and the cultural district uh, anchored by the Albright Knox. Are that, there... that is to say I'm excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> are there any cities in the country that are creating parks today such as how Olmsted would have designed? Well, you know, I, I'm a little cautious with, with how Olmsted works. His parks were very specific uh, and they are largely passive parks. And I think what you have to understand is a park is not a park is not a park. There's a typology of park types we need in our city systems. 
But if you go to Texas, for example, go to Houston and look at the Buffalo Bayou and the flood control that it offers while it delivers a number of both active and passive park amenities. That's a huge city system uh, with multiple stages and increments as, a, as a, a now a, a, a world-class award-winning park system that also, by the way, protects the city of Houston from serious flooding. Um, there are a dozen other examples that are really great precedents. So the answer is yes, indeed, this is a movement. Uh, we see park systems becoming part of the vocabulary of many cities these days. And can you speak on 1 billion to Humboldt Parkway? <laughs> I, I can speak to the damage that Parkway did or that, that, that uh, uh, Kensington Highway has done to the neighborhoods. I can speak to the way following the destruction of that neighborhood, a middle-class black neighborhood at the time, the inequity of that process and the loss of businesses on the, the two commercial streets on either side. I could imagine that the deck and park uh, replacement for the Humboldt would reunite those two sides, would enliven the quality of living in that community, improve the possibility of those homes being restored, repaired, and otherwise replaced, and that the strips might become vital community uh, uh, assets once again. I think it's all about connecting again. When you break a circulation system as the Kensington did, you deny the neighbor to neighbor, neighborhood to neighborhood communication that is so central to what we have to do. So uh, is it a billion dollars? Is it more? Is it last well a journey of a thousand miles starts with? And is it a good investment? Well. Is it the very next thing I would do? No, I think I'd finish our work in, in at LaSalle. Uh, is it the very next thing I would do? Well, uh, I would do it before I would do a, a bring down the Skyway. Um, uh, is it, would I do it before I did Sajakwita? I think you're gonna have to do them both. I think you're gonna have to understand that, that they serve different constituencies and purposes and they both require this kind of attention and investment. Those are all of the questions that we have right now. So I, I see Duncan Hay on the, on the screen here. Duncan, if you're around, um, we should talk a little bit about the Erie Canal way and how the, in the, the Erie Canal uh, Harbor development uh, and now the Buffalo River and our aspirations for the Canal Way might evolve. Are, are you able to sign in with us? Larry, can you, there you go. It's good to see you, Duncan. It's good to see you. It's been too long. So what's going on with the Erie Canal Way in the spirit of, of parks and park systems and cities? Uh, and, and please, Duncan, identify uh, how you're connected with the project. Okay. Um, I, I work with the National Park Service. I'm with the Northeast region, and I'm based in Boston. And much of my work is with Erie Canal Way National Heritage Corridor, which encompasses the four branches of New York's canal system, and the communities along its banks. So there's about 230 some municipalities uh, that are part of Erie Canal Way National Heritage Corridor. Um, and I think the, the, the newest news um, is that uh, the canal system was uh, just two weeks ago, designated a uh, national water trail by the Secretary of the Interior. Uh, I mean, we've recognized that that link between Lake Erie and the Atlantic Ocean and, and uh, north to Lake Ontario and, and Lake Champlain was an important link. Uh, people have been working on it for years and years and years to, to do a shoreside trail. Um, and boaters have used it for years, um, uh, recreational boaters and additional commute to uh, commercial traffic. But having that designation, having that national recognition first as, as a National Heritage Corridor since 2000 and now as a National Water Trail 
um, I think really brings the attention. So it, you know, Bob has been focusing on, on Buffalo and the connections within Buffalo, but uh, the next thing is, well, Buffalo is, is 350, 360 miles from Albany by way of, of places like Rochester and Syracuse and Utica and Rome. Um, so that, that we can sort of expand the vision uh, of a linked um, both green and blue way uh, all across upstate New York. Thank you, Doc. That's great. Yeah. That's a good connection. And Bob, that's the, the much bigger picture. Uh, I think you and I shared visions of this many years ago and, and uh, we're both doing our part to try to uh, uh, execute that vision, if you will. But the, the, the notion of both a, uh, a binational border town that we are, we connect with all the good efforts that have been done in Ontario, uh, literally, and you can imagine connecting with Toronto and the Golden Horseshoe uh, thought process that we did, all of that is of a piece. And you're right, the Erie Canal then, and especially it's sent bicentennial coming up here in a couple of years and in 2025, uh, we're working at it here in Buffalo. How do you connect to the larger picture? And I'll add one more. I, I'm pretty sure Buffalo could be considered a leader uh, in the Olmsted revival movement. Certainly was the, the first system that Olmsted put in in that 1868 to 1898 period. But the idea of reviving them through an organization uh, like the Olmsted Parks Conservancy working collateral, uh, collaboratively with the city uh, and, and designing something. I think they're spearheading a, a national awareness of the importance of Olmsted and how to deal with the hundreds of Olmsted parks that exist throughout America. Buffalo can take a, is taking, I think, a, a major leadership role. Does that ring true to you, Bob? It, it does. Um, I, I think many people look at the model that the city of Buffalo and the Olmsted Parks uh, Conservancy have assembled as, as a, a best practice in, in the way in which citizens collaborate with their municipalities in park ownership and help sustain and maintain and build new within the, those same environments. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, I know, I know that Stephanie Crockett serves on that national board and uh, I have on many occasions been called by people interested in our model based on the planning work we did for the Olmsted Park and Parkway system years ago. I see some other familiar faces on this, uh, uh, this screen. I, I want to greet a new professor, new to Buffalo, Anahita Mahmoudi who is now joining our faculty at the School of Architecture and Planning. And just to say, welcome, Anahita. It's nice to see you in attendance here today. And that's it. Do we uh, garner any last questions, Melissa? Um, just one last question, because we are, of course, the library. So is there any one really good book that you can recommend about Olmstead? <laughs> there, there are many. Uh, Google it. Um, I, I think that Frankowski's book on the best planned city uh, places Olmsted in that context in a way that is really, really excellent. Uh, and he's a local historian who has lived this world. So that, that gives it a further anchor. He would, of course, say Beveridge's books are much more attuned to what we understand about deep history and landscape. I think, I think we know that the, the, the history of landscape architecture is, and I think this may be new to fun folks, uh, is actually the history of planning, that, that it was a landscape architect that founded the American Planning Association. And um, uh, a lots of uh, a due credit to Olmsted's vision for a, a larger framework within which park thinking occurs. Um, Dennis, thank you. I, I feel like a bit too professorial, but uh, I've enjoyed the, the no, opportunity. No, no. And Bob is too modest to do it himself, but I can. Uh, here is, let's see if we can get this book. Ah, it's hard to, there it is. Maybe it is. Bob Shibley, uh, Linda Schneekloff, and Tom Yatz wrote about a hundred page book, which I'm sure the library has, uh, what, 11 years ago, uh, uh, 2011. 
uh, that's a, that's an excellent uh, guide through the whole system idea. And um, I uh, always credited Bob with being ahead of the what now is catching on to be uh, awareness by not only our community, but many others uh, of the necessity of these systems, park systems that they have as treasures uh, to be either rediscovered, uh, certainly reinvigorated uh, usually. Uh, and that's the, the, our generation's challenge in the 21st century. Uh, previous ones built these things, ours is to both maintain and reinvigorate. And that's what I think we're about. Uh, at this point in time, and lucky to luckily uh, have a school of architecture and design uh, and planning rather right here in our midst. Um, uh, I think the only one in the state, Bob. Am I correct on that or not? We are the only graduate uh, accredited school of architecture and planning in the state uh, and in the SUNY system. Um, uh, there are private institutions, of course, that offer graduate education in architecture and planning. I, I, there's one other point I would want to make, and I know we're running past the time, which is, which is to say that uh, there's a tendency to think of Olmsted in some sort of rarefied way that puts it in the class of elite. And that's very far from what his aspiration was. He saw these parks as open and accessible to the entire population, rich and poor, old and young, um, uh, across the races. And we have to nurture that concept as we think about uh, both expanding what constitutes a, a, a park system for our city, and also as we think about the different types of parks environments that our neighborhoods require for good living. And it's all our neighborhoods. It has to be an inclusive profile. So before we get too caught up in, in, in what some would call grass museums and, and adulation for the, the simplicity of the Homestead Park experience, we have to also suggest that there are many other ways to have park experiences and they should all be connected in the park system that we want to ultimately have for our city. So thanks for allowing me to do that, Dennis. Uh, uh, wonderful. I'll, I'll point to the other uh, two panelists with you. Adam Rome spoke on uh, May 24th, 10 days after our tragic uh, events of May 14th, the tops here on the east side. And he spoke of the value of the Olmsted Park, the design of it, and why he was drawn to it the next day, just to spend time and see people and be with people. Uh, in that setting. I, uh, I, the YouTube channel uh, for the library has this just uh, in your search engine, put in Buffalo uh, Library YouTube channel and Imagine series. And uh, I think you'll see, uh, you'll, you'll get the whole list of uh, the 80 plus videos that we've done. So uh, Bob, thank you very much. Uh, we will wrap this up and, uh, and thank you folks for joining us today. We hope to see you back here again next Tuesday, uh, June 21st on Zoom. It'll be our last one for the season. Um, and um, we'll have Lynn Bader, uh, Executive Director for Buffalo Toronto Public Media. Uh, and uh, she'll be talking about uh, the Olmsted videos that will be shown at Chautauqua on Buffalo Day. That's July 5th. Uh, and if, uh, if you haven't heard the good news, everybody from Greater Buffalo is free for the day at Chautauqua. Everybody living in the 14201 all the way through 14280 zip code are free for the day. If you register early, the parking is free. Folks, uh, we're the only city, uh, Chautauqua has a day four, and not only a day, but a free day. So this is quite unique uh, for us in Buffalo. It's July 5th, go to their website, um, uh, or the library is a sponsor, Erie County is a sponsor, uh, and you'll find more information. All the local libraries uh, have flyers pointing to Buffalo Day at Chautauqua, July 5th. 
on a Tuesday this year. All right. Uh, uh, I, uh, we will see you next week, if at all possible. Thank you again, Bob. And thank you, folks. I'm Dennis Galucki. Be well and good day. So Dennis, 20 minutes goes really fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But you did it well, Bob, and I thank you very much. Uh, uh, this part's being recorded, so <laughs> sorry to be aware of that, but uh, nicely done, and it's a great summary. It's a great story. It's the essence of uh, uh, both our, uh, our vocations, I guess. Yes, and congratulations, 466 runs. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I'm going to check out. Take care. I'll see you. I'll see you in Chautauqua. Good deal. <laughs>